Congress participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would very warmly like to welcome you all to the 58th and fully virtual ERA EDTA Congress. Until very recently, we were planning the 58th Congress as a hybrid Congress in Berlin. The global challenges of COVID-19 forced us to reconsider. We were in contact and debates with the Berlin Senate, with support from the Department of Economics, but with deep skepticism from the Department of Health. In the end, and while the Berlin decision was still pending, the ERA EDTA Council had to decide and voted pro a fully virtual Congress. There was indeed some initial disappointment, but it quickly changed into excitement. After Milan in 2020, it is now the second fully virtual annual ERA EDTA Congress, and we have learned to use its opportunities and make the most out of it. You can easily join from anywhere, and the sessions are available to be viewed anytime after the Congress. But it is not just about the format. We are delighted that we can offer you a Congress program with many highlights that has lost none of its diversity, scope, and quality. At this point, a few available numbers. I need the Congress highlights. We have two hands-on courses, four moderated mini oral sessions, about 56 selected abstracts, plenary lectures, CEPD courses, industry-sponsored symposia, free communication sessions, and especially 56 main symposia with 170 talks. We have 237 unique speakers who are distributed throughout the world, as you can see here. The top 10 countries led by Italy, Germany, and UK. We have 178 unique chair distribution all over the world, uh, mainly, of course, from Europe. Uh, top five countries, Italy, Germany, UK, the Netherlands, and Spain. The Congress highlights were the abstracts. We have 1,346 submitted ab abstracts, and we were able to accept 1,190 out of them. Top three countries, Spain, Italy, and UK. We have more than 5,000 participants from 115 countries, and probably throughout the Congress, this will add up to some hundreds more. It is now time to say thank you to all who committed themselves and devoted many hours and days to make this Congress happen. With regards to the scientific committee, I most sincerely thank Gianni Battista Capasso, who has worked very hard to provide the latest cutting-edge science. He was supported by Maria José Soler Romeo, who acted as the chair of the paper selection committee. The final form of the program is the result of many hours of joint work of the scientific committee chair, the Congress president, the paper selection committee chair, and last but not least, Giuseppe Palladino, ERA EDTA research and development manager, and of all devoted volunteers who contributed by working in those committees, reviewing abstracts, etc. With deep gratitude, I would also like to thank Monica Fontana and her team from the ERA EDTA headquarters for their professional and extremely flexible work and guidance throughout all these difficult changing momentums, as well as necessary adjustments, which guaranteed that the virtual Congress will become a very successful one. Furthermore, my warmest thanks to the leadership of my colleague and friend, ERA EDTA President Christoph Wanner and the Council for making wise decisions in troubled times. I'm also deeply grateful for the collaboration with the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Nephrology, the German Society of Nephrology, represented by their president, Professor Hermann Pavenstedt, who made this a joint congress, which I strongly believe is a win-win situation for both societies and all members. And last but not least, thanks to all sponsors and industry for trusting in and keeping up with us, to all of you, dear participants, presenters, lecturers, chairs, for making this Congress happen. I would like to invite you most sincerely to be our guests from now onwards, and I now hand over to uh, Christoph, to Professor Christoph Wanner, uh, the current president of the association. Thank you, Markus. Uh, thank you, Professor Ketteler. And I would like to see my picture presented. Thank you. Great. 
So again, also a warm welcome to all of you members of the European Renal Association, EDTA, and Congress participants. I also welcome the President's Emeriti, the Council members, editors, the Scientific Advisory Board, members of the Young Nephrology Platform, and the social media team. Colleagues and experts from the registry, the working group, participants and ERBP, and finally, the backbone of our association, the Parma Headquarter Office staff. For ERA EDTA, from the Milano 57th Congress 2020 until today, I'm overlooking the association, being one year in so-called lockdown and working remotely. During these days, the Council has adapted to the situation and carried forward the activities of the association for the benefits of nephrology in Europe. Carried forward with weekly council meetings. I'm very proud to say that today the ERA EDTA stands stronger than before. Many activities have been very successful, several have been refurbished and some have dropped a real renewal process. Therefore, 2020 was yet another good year also for the financial consolidation of the association. I thank you, the members of the association and Congress participants, to have stayed on board and from today value the clinical education and the scientific program the association is bringing to you. The day will come when we will meet again in person. And I can imagine next year in Paris is the day. Many of the new inventions or how to conduct a virtual Congress will remain. Hybrid components will be introduced in every major Congress worldwide. Who will come to interact face to face and who will remain at home? Council members have made several observations. We experienced that those in the mid of their career, the 33 to 42 years old, suffer the most. Male colleagues who already stepped up during their professional life want to enhance their visibility, building up networks for advancing their career. They feel having lost two years within a critical period of their professional life. Women clinician scientists, trained and educated, often start to build a family during this period. And children do not appreciate frequent traveling of their mothers. The virtual format of a Congress assists women to share, to present, to discuss from remote, keeping up with advancing science and to return at the latest time point into academia or into the working process. We do need kidney specialists urgently in Europe and we have to train young people. I have followed the rise of a Congress program chaired by Professor Gianni Capasso, who did a brilliant work including talented women, clinicians and scientists, to keep them in the loop. We, the advanced and settled, already have established a network. We know each other and survived well at home. Maybe not all. The Council missed the classic brainstorming and the consensus processes being done live much better. Similarly, strategic thinking and decision-making while looking into each other's eyes require physical meetings. Therefore, we are convinced we need to go back to face-to-face -face as soon as possible for a few occasions. Vice versa, clinicians caring for the patients in her, his daily routine work want to come back for education and getting up to date with the latest testments or treatments and discoveries and receiving CME accreditation. The trainees appreciate the electronic formats, the chats, the videos, the bulletins, 
the short, concise education, the flexibility of moving in between two sessions, running two computers in parallel. Digested views already come across the social media in real time. I have learned a lot from the social media and working group of the ERA, introduced by our counselor, Kate Stevens. In addition to many of you remote, the Young Nephrology platform offers many opportunities. In fact, ERA EDTA is a growing society, growing through its young members. My sincere word of thank you goes to the reviewers of the abstracts submitted to our Congress. They have given special attention to the new clinical and scientific results the authors wanted to show the medical, clinical and scientific community. Also thank, I also thank the authors who have decided to bring their results to ERA EDTA and the speakers who agreed to contribute with their expertise. With your support, you have voted for the ERA EDTA Congress and value the association's work to provide a good platform and visibility to you and to your messages. We do our best to multiply your efforts and spread the news across Europe and throughout the world. On another topic, on a global level, the nephrology community was debating the nomenclature for renal function and disease. The discussion has involved international journal editors and societies. As suggested, the word renal should be replaced by the word kidney in the scientific literature and beyond. An example, renal replacement therapy will be kidney replacement therapy in the future. The Council of the ERA EDTA and the wider member community recognized that the word renal is embedded in many languages in Europe and can even be understood by lay people, by the general population. By consensus and after intense discussion, the Council proposes to the membership of ERA EDTA that ERA, the R European Renal Association, should stay as it is. However, the Council is open to modern and renewed view on the name of our association. Communication and acceptance is key today for modern professional societies. And ERA, the European Renal Association or the European Society of Nephrology is such an ideal example. On Monday, the Council will propose to the General Assembly to keep ERA and to move EDTA into the history of more or more to the background of visibility. We will vote on this proposal, ERA, during the General Assembly. The scientific program of the 58th ERA EDTA Congress is telling you where nephrology is progressing or going in the future. There are the traditional two components of CKD and kidney replacement therapy, which is dialysis and transplantation. We as nephrologists have, to cult have a culture of mechanistic thinking based in an in-depth understanding of physiology. Refreshing physiology to understand hemodynamic and metabolic signals emerging from the kidney and expanding to the heart and the brain is important as well. However, we have to expand our knowledge in two major fields, that is diabetes treatments and emerging therapies for rare diseases, kidney diseases. This morning again, glomerulonephritis and immunology were the most attended sessions. A real challenge is the revolution in unraveling rare genetic disorders and providing new albeit expensive treatments. I do not have a remedy how to keep up with all the new science and clinical information, but the world around us is expecting from us to know everything around the kidney. This defines our role and justifies our position. Education is key and we aim for it in our programs. 
not preferred is splitting up nephrology into subspecialists, but this is seen only outside Europe so far. We still care for CKD dialysis and transplantation and should continue in Europe. The nephrologist should reject to be fragmented, remaining either a dialysis doctor working in a center or a doctor without dialysis working in regression clinics. For the rare diseases, diseases, a model is currently evolving. The concept of reference centers for a single rare disease. Multidisciplinary teams are led often by nephrologists. Patients with rare diseases afford to travel once per year to the reference center where they look into eyes of doctors who understand their disease. For the remaining year, patients are treating decentrally with their local nephrologist having a rare disease. I believe that this model provides some guidance how to manage rare and ultra-rare diseases in the future. Every country may identify specialists and build up such centers. My plea to nephrologists today is to open up, go broader, also into aspects of internal medicine. The next generation of doctors, young doctors, are moving in this direction. They do not like to be split being only a dialysis doctor or only a diabetes nephrologist. Remember, we already lost some space. For example, the field of kidney stones in some countries and kidney cancer in most. This time in Berlin, the Council wanted to give all of you, and especially the next generation, a chance to meet. I'm in Berlin, with permission of the Berlin Senate, as Professor Ketterer already pointed out, for a group of vaccinated nephrologists. I see the city and the world just opened up in these days. We were just a bit too early, but I'm looking forward seeing you next year in Paris. Thank you very much and wish you interesting days ahead. I hand now over to Hermann Pafenstedt. He's a professor of medicine and nephrology at the University Hospital of Münster and the president, the current president of the German Society of Nephrology. Hermann, please. Thank you very much, Christoph. Dear Markus, dear Christoph, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pity that there can't be a face-to-face -face congress, but it's nice that we can still meet digitally to talk about interesting topics in nephrology. Research in nephrology has made very good advances in the last years. Basic, digital, and clinical medicine have been better interlinked, and we are well on the way to individual precision medicine for patients with renal diseases. Our interaction at the European level will be even more important in the future to perform studies in the basic science, to initiate large clinical trials, and to motivate politicians to improve the care of patients suffering from renal diseases. This Congress includes important social and scientific topics, everything a nephrologist's heart desires. It's incredibly time-consuming to organize a conference digitally, hence my admiration and thanks to everyone who committed themselves to the Congress. As a re representative of the German Society of Nephrology, I wish all participants a very good and interesting time at the Congress. It's now a great pleasure and honor for us that the research minister of Germany, Mrs. Kalicek, has kindly agreed to welcome the participants of the Congress. She is not here, but we do have her video message. Thanks a lot. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, über 9000 Menschen warten in Deutschland auf ein Spenderorgan und die meisten von ihnen auf eine Niere und das über viele Jahre. Denn dieser langen Warteliste gegenüber stehen im vergangenen Jahr nur 913 Organspenderinnen und Organspender. Das sind schlichte Zahlen. Konkret wird die Sache erst, wenn diejenigen sprechen, die auf eine Niere warten, die jede Woche mehrmals zur Dialyse fahren, die bei jedem Telefon klingeln, auf die Nachricht hoffen, wir haben für sie ein passendes Spenderorgan. 
Zehn Prozent der Bevölkerung in den Industriestaaten leiden mittlerweile an chronischen Nierenerkrankungen. Das ist eine Riesenaufgabe für die Medizin. Und deshalb fördern wir, dass der Forschung schnell die Anwendung folgt. Und wir fördern die Vernetzung der Universitätsmedizin mit der Gesundheitsforschung außerhalb der Universitäten. Beispielhaft setzen das zum Beispiel die deutschen Zentren der Gesundheitsforschung um. Doch der Forschungsbedarf ist auch bei vielen Krankheitsgruppen groß, zu denen wir kein solches Zentrum haben. Und deshalb unterstützen wir zum Beispiel die themenoffene Erforschung dazu, wie diese Krankheiten überhaupt entstehen. Und daran schließen die präklinische Entwicklung und auch die frühe klinische Forschung an. Das geht hin bis zu Therapien am Patienten, denn jeder Patient ist anders. Und deshalb ist die Medizin der Zukunft auch viel, viel stärker personalisiert. Das verändert die Behandlung grundlegend. Und um diese Chance zu nutzen, bringen wir die Forschung zusammen mit Kliniken, mit der Industrie, aber auch mit der Patientenschaft, den Zulassungsbehörden und den Krankenkassen. Die neuen Projekte dazu starten in diesem Jahr. Und ich freue mich besonders, dass mit Uptake ein Nierenforschungsprojekt dabei ist. Das Klinikum Bayreuth und die Universitätsklinik Erlangen wollen ein neuartiges, nicht-invasives Diagnoseverfahren dem Praxistest unterziehen. Das könnte die Therapie für Patientinnen und Patienten entscheidend verbessern. Und wir fördern diese anwendungsbezogene Forschung zu Nierenerkrankungen auch auf europäischer Ebene. Dabei wollen wir viel stärker als bislang die Patientinnen und Patienten mit einbeziehen. Denn je mehr wir dann darüber wissen, was sie brauchen, desto besser kann auch Forschung und damit dann auch Behandlung sowie Lebensqualität sein. Forschungsergebnisse kommen schneller an und hoffentlich auch verständlicher für die Erkrankten, für die es ja manchmal wirklich um alles geht. Denn es geht nicht nur um das einzelne Organ, es geht um die Auswirkungen auf den ganzen Körper und, nicht zu unterschätzen, auch auf die Psyche. Wenn die Dialyse einen schlapp und müde macht, wenn das ständige Hoffen auf ein Spenderorgan Kraft kostet, die man eigentlich für Familie und Beruf braucht. Und dann die alles entscheidende Frage, ob der Körper das Spenderorgan akzeptiert. Deswegen darf ich an dieser Stelle Ihnen einmal ganz herzlich Danke sagen für Ihren großen Einsatz bei der Erforschung der Nierenerkrankungen. Ihre Arbeit wird vielen Menschen das Leben sehr erleichtern und das ist ein großer Ansporn. Ich sage Ihnen viel Erfolg. We are now coming to the part of the recognition and awards. Many have served over the years for the association and I want to first introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Ketteler. Uh, Markus, uh, I'm very delighted to offer you the recognition of the society for having served as a Congress president, uh, this Congress president and prepared the Congress over the past year. So the society will offer you a diploma and the diploma is now given to you and I read it. Uh, Markus Ketteler was president of the 58th fully virtual ERA EDJ Congress June 5 to 8, 2020 and performed his duty efficiently, responsible and in a highly professional way. Signed, Professor Ivan Richlig, ERA, EDTA, Secretary, Treasurer, and myself. Very delighted, Markus, to give you the certificate uh, for your services. Thank you so much, Christoph. I feel honored and very proud to be able to wear this chain of the Congress president this year. And um, I'm looking forward to the next uh, two and a half days with a lot of excitement. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we move now on and I have uh, the honor to introduce to you Professor Gianni Capasso. He is a professor of nephrology at the University of Naples in Italy. Gianni Capasso has served in the past two years as the chair of the scientific committee and has raised an outstanding program which we can follow in the next two and a half days. I'm very delighted to handle over this uh, diploma, this certificate to you, Gianni. 
And I'm reading that uh, Giovanni Giovan Battista Capasso was chair of the scientific committee of the 58th fully virtual ERA EDTA Congress, June 5 to 8, 2021, and performed his duty efficiently, responsibly, and in a highly professional way, signed Professor Ivan Richlik, Secretary Treasurer, and myself. Chani, a pleasure for us. Uh, Mr. President, dear Christoph, it has been an honor for me and a privilege to serve the society as a chairman of the scientific committee. I hope that the program that we have assembled together with the rest of the other scientific committee will meet the expectation of all the members of the society. Thank you again. As you say, it has been indeed a great privilege. Thank you, Professor Capasso. We are now coming uh, to our awards. And the first and one of very prominent awards goes to Professor David Chain. He is Professor of uh, Clinical Autoimmunity at the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom, and Director of the Vasculitis and Lupus Service at Edinburgh's Hospital, Cambridge. He trained at the Universities of Cambridge and London and in Nephrology at Harvard Medical School, Boston, the USA. Since 2001, he has been working in Cambridge, where he is an honorary consultant physician at Edinburgh's hospital. His research has focused on ANCA-associated vasculitis and on the development of clinical trials to optimize current therapies and introduce new agents. Topics have included intravenous immunoglobulin, plasma exchange, mycophenolate, mofetil, and several newer immunosuppressives, including recently avacopan and rituximab, and we have seen the prominent papers. In parallel, he has investigated newer therapies in SLE and lupus nephritis, including stem cell transplantation, mycophenolate, mofetil, and many immunomodulators. He is president of the European Vasculitis Society and coordinator of trials and academic meetings. He has published over 600 papers and has chaired or contributed to numerous guideline statements, including the EULAR ERA EDTA task force on lupus nephritis and KDGO guidelines for glomerulonephritis. I'm very delighted and welcome Professor David Chain and make you a personal comment. I was a young doctor, it was before 2000, and then I had some question for the Anka title to in, for, and interpretation. So I was told there is a young guy in UK, call him and he will tell you everything about uh, the Anka diagnostics and interpretation. So actually this was a long time ago and I'm very happy and proud to hand over the certificate uh, from the ERA EDTA and the certificate go goes along with uh, a plaque and the plaque is coming to you. I have to handle this uh, for your ERA EDTA award for the outstanding clinical contributions to nephrology and the diploma, which is, uh, says that Professor David Chain is uh, the winner of the 2021 ERA EDTA award for outstanding clinical contribution to the nephrology. Ivan Richlik, Secretary Pressure, and signed by myself. Davis, I'm very happy that you got this award and I hand over to you for a few words. Mr. President, uh, Christoph, uh, thank you very much for those words. It's uh, truly an honor to receive uh, this award. Um, the European Renal Association and the Immunopathology Working Group and its members have really been vital collaborators in much of the work that I've done in vasculitis and lupus nephritis over the years. And uh, if I have one message, really, for uh, those listening today, it's for, for younger researchers to try to engage with the European Renal Association 
and other European groups to promote collaboration and interaction, which is just what I did uh, over 30 years ago, the first time I attended the European Renal Association. I think it's a great format that we have in Europe for conducting a collaborative research. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and very proud to have you within this um, group of, uh, of winners for excellency. Thank you. We move along. Uh, the ERA EDTA has another prestigious award to provide, and uh, the winner of this prestigious award goes to Professor Jesus Carrero, and he uh, is winning the prize for the research excellency in nephrology. Uh, Professor Carrero is a professor of kidney epidemiology at the Department of Medical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. His principal research interests focus on the identification of modifiable causes of morbidity and mortality in persons with CKD through clinical epidemiological approaches. His interest areas of areas of interest involve lifestyle habits diet quality monitoring and outcomes of nutritional abnormalities and also medications medication errors drug safety and effectiveness in person with ckd jj carrero as i may call you published over 450 peer-reviewed articles. Its age index, Web of Science, is 70, his Google Scholar, 93, and he has more than 36,000 citations. As well as he has written numerous book chapters. He was involved in the making of the 2020 KDOKI and 2021 Aspen guidelines for nutritional management of persons with CKD. He is chair of the European Renal Nutrition Working Group, ERN Working Group, a working group of the ERA EDTA and co-chair of the Total Nutrition Therapy TNT Renal Program of the International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism, ISRNM. So I'm very proud and happy to have you uh, JJ among the winners of uh, this prestigious award and I have a plug for you as well. The ERA EDTA Research Excellence in Nephrology and it goes along with a diploma and the diploma reads uh, Juan Jesus Carrero is the winner of the 2021 ERA EDTA Award for Research Excellence in Nephrology, signed Ivan Richlik, Secretary Treasurer, and myself. Very happy to handle this over, and please give us some words um, towards uh, your maybe excitement. Yeah. Dear Christoph, uh, thank you very much for your words. It's a very special honor for me to receive this award because I owe to this society my passion for nephrology. After all, it's thanks to the ERA EVTA's fellowship program that I could make my postdoc at Karolinska Institute and I stayed here. I'm proud to be part of the EVTA family. Here I have met wonderful collaborators, now long-standing friends, with a genuine commitment to help people with kidney disease. I thank everyone who has ever crossed paths with me, providing inspiration, ideas, and sometimes unique databases. I want to take one moment to dedicate this award to my mentors, Ben Lindholm and Pietro Stenwinkel, and to my team, both uh, physically at Karolinska and virtually at the Netherlands, Canada, US, Brazil, China, and many more. It is these people to whom the credit is due for the award that I received. Finally, I thank my parents who supported me all the way and my wife and kids who bring meaning and encouragement to my work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Carrero. Extraordinary career and an example for all young nephrologists. Thank you very much. 
the ERA EDTA uh, has to distribute or has to give another award. Yeah? It is dedicated to our well-known master in nephrology. The first Stanley Sheldon Award was given in 2012, and now we are in a 10-year row. The Stanley Sheldon Award is designed to be an acknowledgement to young investigators who, thanks to his her early achievements, stimulate the dialogue between education and research. The awardee receives the Stanley Sheldon Prize, which consists of a price of 10,000 euro. And I'm very happy uh, to hand over the prize to Professor Timotis Speer, who is a professor at uh, the University Hospital of uh, Saarland. He's a full professor for translational cardiorenal medicine and deputy head of the Department of Nephrology. Nephrology and Hypertension at the Saarland University Homburg Saar in Germany. His main research focus is to study the role of inflammation in the development of cardiovascular diseases in patients with chronic kidney disease and to explore processes leading to kidney fibrosis. Therefore, his research comprises clinical studies, large and genetic associations, uh, association studies in the genetic field, as well as a basic science, science investigation. His studies are published in the highest ranked journals, including the Lancet, Nature Immunology, Immunity, and Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology. He built up a well-equipped laboratory in Homburg Saar, including state-of-the-art techniques such as super-resolution, laser scanning, microscopy, and he is the head of 15 lab members. In 2019, he was awarded with the Heinz Meyer Leibniz Award, which is the most important award for German, sci German scientists across all research disciplines who are younger than 40 years. His work is embedded in several national and international research consortia, including the German Collaborative Research Center, SFB, which aims at identifying mechanism of cardiovascular disease in patients with chronic kidney disease. So very happy, uh, Professor Speer, to hand over you the Stanley Sheldon Award. And uh, I'm reading the, st the certificate. The win uh, Timothy Speer is the winner of the 2021 ERA EDT Stanley Sheldon Award for Young Investigators, signed Professor Ivan Richlik, Secretary Treasurer and myself. And it comes along with a nice plug and I hope you will enjoy. And uh, we are honored to have you among the distinguished researchers and uh, I'm hand over to you to give us uh, a few words. Dear President, dear Professor Warner, many thanks for this prestigious award. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to receive this extraordinary distinction today, particularly since my personal career is closely affiliated with the ERA EDTA for more than 10 years. I would also thank my colleagues in Homburg Saar and my national and international collaborators, in particular my mentor, Professor Danilo Flieser, for his support and close cooperation for many years now. Thank you very much. I just want to add that this award, of course, goes ahead with a prize um, money of 10,000 euro, and I hope this will help to um, make your career uh, even better in the future. Thank you very much. So um, now we are coming to a very important moment of our opening ceremony, uh, which is actually the um, keynote lecture. And I hand over to Professor Gianni Capasso to introduce the speaker, please. And uh, as you know, uh, the banner team of this Congress is uh, Healthy Environment, Healthy Kidneys. 
To this end, the welcome lecture that I'm introducing looks to be quite appropriate. It will be delivered by Professor Carlo Barbande, that is the director of the Institute of Polar Science of the National Research Council of Italy, and he is a full professor at the Kafoska University of Venice, where he's been dealing since a long time with the development of analytical methods and thematic reconstruction to unreveal the secrets of the Earth climate. He is a well-known scientist, and it's very important, a very a peculiar part of his career, that he has participated in several expeditions in polar regions. He has been named Professor of Active Climate at Harvard Summer School, and he has been granted by the European Research Council with a prestigious advanced grant to study the earliest sign of a human impact on climate. Currently, is also past president of the Italian Society for Climate Sciences and a national representative in the Horizon 2020 Program Committee on Climate Action. He is a coordinator of the European project named Beyond Epica, aiming to retrieve a half, uh, one and a half million years old ice in Antarctica. Carlo Babande is going this November again to, uh, to uh, uh, Antarctica. And he has the chance to uh, ask a, a person to join his group. Generally, in the past, he has to decide what to, to bring, either a doctor, and you can understand why, or a chef. This year, it will barely believe to that some nephrologist or one nephrologist could join his group and go with him in Antarctica. So the nephrologist won't like to, to, I mean, to, to, to reach this goal, uh, asking actually to ask the Babante to join him. But be aware, there should be good nephrologist as usual, but it could, should be also a good master chef. And that, please take note and send your application to, uh, to Professor Carlo Barbante. Now, after this um, introduction, I think it's a time to ask Carlo to deliver his uh, talk. The, the title will be Too Late for Two Centuries from the Paris Agreement to the Climate of Tomorrow. Please, Carlo. Thank you. Thank you, Gianni. Uh, thank you to the uh, Scientific Steering Committee of um, ERI EDTA. I'm very, very pleased to give this talk, especially because it's a real special day, and I will tell you in a minute. Uh, I had, I must be honest, I, I wanted to be a medical doctor at, at the beginning of my career, but you know, life is sometimes very strange. And I, I ended up to, to work in this uh, fascinating, in this fascinating field. I really wish uh, we all could be in Berlin, but uh, we have to adapt and to do it in remote COVID also affected a lot our expedition to the polar region. Uh, we lost one season last year. We hope to go this year despite many, many uh, drawbacks and problems that we might face. Anyway, we'll go. Uh, thank you very much. I will speak to you about uh, uh, the climate um, and I will, uh, everything is dealing with the, what I'm dealing today. It comes from uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change reports, special reports. Uh, we are waiting for the new uh, report on climate uh, coming up in October this year. But those uh, special reports on global warming of 1.5 degrees came after Paris Agreement uh, in 2015. Climate change in land and ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate are of paramount importance for that. Uh, we 
uh, are incredibly uh, committed to, to climate uh, is a big, big issue uh, with uh, within the next uh, decades. Uh, certainly one of the major problems we are facing, uh, we faced already one in the, in the pandemic now, but the mo more subtle is something that is coming up with the climatic crisis. Uh, we have uh, uh, six fundamental questions that we uh, want to guide you today uh, uh, in the uh, dealing with the, with the climate. It is basically uh, dealing with the, how climate works, and especially uh, the greenhouse gas effect, which is so important for the climate of today and of the future, is a problem of detection. Can we detect really that climate is warming? Uh, and then can we attribute uh, the, the, the global warming to some causes, especially, as I said, and I anticipated to the uh, greenhouse gas emission? And uh, why do we have to care about this? What are the impact and risks of global warming uh, in, these, uh, in these days? And then, again, how can we tackle and manage the problem of global warming, especially uh, the problem of adaptation and mitigation? So we know already that things are going on. The, the climate is warming. So we have to try to manage what is already unavoidable. We know that the, the, the status of equilibrium of our planet is already uh, be, be above the threshold, but we also have to try to avoid something that might be unmanageable for the future. And then um, we are at the turning point now. Uh, what can we expect for the future? I told you that this is a very special day today. Uh, I don't know if you if you did it in purpose, Johnny, but today is the World Environment Day, uh, which is a special day, is the day in which the United Nations uh, want to vehicle uh, for encouraging awareness and action for the protection of the environment. So the 5th of June is a very special, a very special day. And this is our planet, how you can see, seen from uh, uh, quite far away, is a composite of many satellite uh, pictures. Uh, but what I want to tell you is a planet which is 6,500 kilometers in, in radius, but with a very, very uh, tiny uh, layer of paint, which is more or less what we consider the troposphere, just 10 kilometers thick. Uh, it is uh, like a layer of paint covering the Earth. And through the atmosphere, everything is mediated. We receive the energy from the sun. And in this very thin, thin layer of uh, gases, a mixture of gases, water vapor, or greenhouse gases, uh, we have uh, everything uh, happening. So. Uh, basically, in these 10 kilometers, we play our uh, present and our future. The energy is coming from the sun, about 300 watt per square meter, about the energy of three uh, lamp, uh, bulb lamp uh, into, the, into the atmosphere. Uh, most of the radiation coming through the, uh, into the Earth is reflected back, so we retain about 47%. But the Earth is also behaving as a black body and is reflecting back the energy, uh, and usually at a long wave radiation. And uh, it goes back, but in some cases, because of the presence of greenhouse gases, is trapped into the lower part of the atmosphere. So the higher concentration of greenhouse gases, the higher would be the temperature of our planet in, um, in the future. We know that the greenhouse gases concentration is increasing. Uh, we know the mechanism since hundreds of years is not something new. Arrhenius and other physicists knew since the uh, 18th and 19th century that increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases, the temperature would have been increased. And they could quantify long, long time ago about this process. It's not something new. And so they calculated and they uh, put the cause and effect all together in a good in a good perspective. So, if you look at that, this is a graph reporting the temperature, or better, the anomaly of the temperature. Anomaly is given in a average value taken as a reference. The average temperature in between 1951, 1980, and if it is uh, above that, it means uh, is a uh, is a positive anomaly. If it is lower, is a negative anomaly. But what is very important is the trend uh, over the last 140 years that you see both for the temperature above land, which is a average globally in all the planet, and for the average above the sea, the temperature is increasing uh, dramatically. Uh, is more than 
in average, if you took together uh, the, the, the land and the sea, is more than 1.2 degree uh, after uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution. And the difference in between the land and the sea is because land retain a lot of energy because of uh, the heat capacity of the water, of the incredibly mass of water. This is an average altogether, but the planet is very diversified. And if we look at that, uh, and if you consider the warming from 1880 to 2050 uh, all over the world, you can see that there are places in the world where the warming is uh, very, very, is, is going pretty fast, and other places which are, in contrast, uh, cooling down pretty, uh, pretty quickly. But the most dramatic things happen in the last few decades, where you see red and red happening, especially in the northern hemisphere and in the Arctic. And when, uh, while I told you that the average uh, temp increase of temperature is of about 1.2 degree globally, the Arctic warmed up of more than the double of that uh, because of a process which is called Arctic amplification with all the problems that we might have. I can show you many of this uh, graph and temperature all over the world in many different environmental matrices. But something that can be even more, uh, more interesting is uh, to, to look at global warming at work. And this is a case of, uh, for instance, a glacier. Glaciers are sentinel of climate change. This is just a three-year record, or the, is a time lapse of uh, three years on these glaciers in Alaska. You see how fast climate is uh, melting the ice and how dramatically. And this is an irreversible, irreversible process. So now, and then uh, three years later, you see the difference, the dramatic difference of the ice. And you can see on another place, again, three years and eight months month on the Solheim Glacier in Iceland, you'll see the melting of the ice and how fast is all this system going. On another way, you can also look at this um, uh, at these um, uh, satellite imageries, satellite are used to measure the mass of the ice in uh, in Greenland, for instance, and this is uh, this is, uh, for instance, the uh, melting of the ice during the last twenty years. Uh, Greenland is losing ice at the at a very very high speed. I can tell you that is uh, dramatically, and again, that what is happening is an irreversible um, process. If you count down during the last 20, 20 years, uh, Greenland is losing ice at the speed of 280 gigaton of ice per year. It doesn't tell you that much. It's a huge number. I tell you that it contributes to about one millimeter per year of sea level rise, or even on a much uh, easier way to understand, uh, is losing ice at the speed of uh, uh, f that can feel about uh, 420 Olympic swimming pool every minute, and these every minute of the year. So the the, the velocity in which the, the uh, ice is melting from Greenland and for Antarctica and from non-polar regions is incredibly high. And this contributes a lot to uh, the uh, acceleration of sea level rise. Uh, if uh, we had, uh, during the period of time from 1880 to 2000, uh, less than uh, two millimeter per year increasing sea level, which was due already to the warming uh, induced by human activities. During the last 15 years, so from 2000 and 2015, the increase of the, uh, of the sea level was of about 3.6 millimeter per year. In the last decade, in the last, sorry, in the last five years, from 2015 to 2019, the velocity in which the uh, sea level rise is of about 4.8 millimeter per year. You can easily make calculation, multiply by 10 or 100, and see where all this level goes. This is uh, affecting dramatically all the uh, all the um, the cost, and especially many many coastal many coastal regions. So, if you want to put everything on a right perspective and understanding better what is going on, we do use what we call climatic archives. Basically, we go on on uh, on ice sheets like Antarctica and Greenland. We drill deep ice core, and we can reconstruct the 
the climate of the past. We do use uh, these ice cores, which are uh, 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 the cylinder of ice, which have a, a diameter of 10 centimeters. They can be extracted in pieces of uh, two or three meters each. Uh, uh, piling up one after the other one. And you should know that uh, when the snow falls down, it accumulates a lot of things in, into the atmosphere, including the air, which is trapped into this tiny bubble. So we can have information from the past because of the uh, composition of the atmosphere and also because of the temperature that we can reconstruct looking at the isotopic composition of the, uh, of the ice itself. Uh, again, uh, if we look back in time, and we can go back in time about uh, 800,000 of years in Antarctica, we can reconstruct the record of the temperature. So our temperature change from glacial to interglacial period to cold and warm, cold and warm. This is a, there is a cyclicity, which is mostly uh, due to orbital uh, influence of the uh, planets to the Earth, and so the amount of energy that arrive into the surface. Uh, but we can, as I said, we can also look at the composition of greenhouse gases, which are tightly linked to the temperature, as you can see, except that if you look at the last few decades, the concentration of CO2 went up to uh, uh, 415 parts per million. Never and never during the last 800,000 years, our planet experienced such a high concentration of greenhouse gases. The concentration of greenhouse gases have therefore increased to levels which are unprecedented in the last 800,000 years, and even before, because we do have data from a period of time uh, precedent to that. And this quite um, in many, many different places, as you can see, in this graph, uh, we report here on the right the concentration of greenhouse gases, uh, which have been measured in Manua Loa in the Hawaii, is an observatory uh, in which the CO2 concentration is measured since the 80s. And you can see the average value in blue increasing and increasing, while there are oscillation, which are also reported for many other places of the world here uh, into many different spots, uh, which is due to the oscillation, is due to the seasonal variation, because during summer, CO2 is withdrawn from the atmosphere and taken from the vegetation, uh, while in winter, uh, this effect, the photosynthesis, doesn't work uh, that much. Uh, concentration of CO2 is increasing since the industrial, industrial revolution, and we know that there is a tightly link in between greenhouse gases and the temperature of our planet. The cause effect is more or less the same. Uh, we have the same degree of, uh, of knowledge uh, that is on the medical, on the medical basis that the fact that is the link in between the, the smoke of cigarettes and, and cancer to the lungs or the effect, the positive effect that vaccines have into the uh, many, many uh, other, other disease. We can even go back in time because we have data from the same spot uh, uh, during the 60s and 70s. And before that, as I told you, the information that we can retrieve come from ice core. And what I want to show you is to compare the pre-industrial value with the current value. So is incredibly, incredibly high. And the speed in which all this happened is in incredible. So again, we come to uh, the attribution, uh, the attribution of climate change. What is really due to that? We know from the observation, we know from the mechanism and processes that the, the greenhouse gases are the culprit for that. But we can also explain it using models. Models are mathematical equations that we use to understand and to uh, uh, attribute the climate change. We don't have an equation for the climate. Uh, it doesn't exist. But we can bring things together and many processes, and we can input this model and to see if the model can uh, mimic the observation, for instance, of the temperature anomaly over the last uh, 100 years. And if we put all the things together, natural forcing of climate and anthropogenic forcing, as we have seen, we can uh, well replicate uh, the, the observation. So simulation, taking into account all that, can modulate and, and can uh, replicate very well that. So if we can do another things and run uh, models 
without any anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic forcing, so taking away uh, CO2 concentration and all other anthropogenic forces forcing, and we run the model, we can see that the model can't predict exactly the observation. So the missing value here is tightly linked to the uh, to the greenhouse gases, to the anthropogenic forcing. So to explain the increase of the temperature of the last 100 years, we need to input into the model the uh, CO2 concentration and greenhouse gas concentration. So we know the cause. Uh, we know that the increase in greenhouse gases uh, is extremely important. The human influence on climate is clear. And the effect of that we can see in the atmosphere, in land, ocean, in extreme events that many of us has faced during the last decades, in water cycle, in the loss of sea ice, in, in the increase of sea level rise as we, as we have seen. Just a few examples of impact uh, and the reason why we have to care about that. Uh, I'm actually speaking to you from this house, which is in the southern tip of Dolomites. This is my house. Uh, and a few years ago, in 2018, we experienced one of the most uh, extreme events with storm and flooding. It was a very, very, quite normal uh, situation, but this low pressure find the Mediterranean Sea three degrees warmer than normal. And this made up of a normal things a very, very strong effect. And if you look at the trees here, uh, taken with the drone at the distance of a few months, you see the devastation and the devastating uh, strength of this uh, uh, of this storm. That uh, uh, with winds that more than 120 kilometers per hour, and the roof of my house was almost taken away. If you look at the trees, there is no one uh, no one more in the in the in place. So that's one of the extreme events we are dealing with: floating, strong winds, extreme precipitation. But something else that can be considered is also uh, heat waves. We don't die because of water, but most likely because of high temperature. This, uh, this is one example of here in the right of, uh, of uh, um, the heat wave in 2003 in Paris, which caused a very, very high increase in mortality because of that. This is the heat wave we have uh, two years ago in summer, in uh, July, August in Europe. And this is a big, big problem because we as a human body, and you medical doctor knows much better than me, we are a thermal machine. We exchange heat with the external and we can do that with uh, through conduction or transpiration. Under certain condition of high humidity and high temperature, simply the thermal machine doesn't work anymore. So we have a lot of problem in keeping things and temperature down. So exchanging exchanging temperature with the uh, with the, um, with the outside. So that's a big problem. Another strong impact on the environment can be seen on oceans. Uh, increasing CO2 into the into the atmosphere and the transfer of CO2 into the ocean make uh, the ocean more more acidic and therefore the, if the acidification increase we have problem in the coral reef for instance with bleaching and destruction of the coral reef so um, the, 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 this is an, in, an incredible important uh, things that we we have to, to care about and many things have been already affected by climate change if you look at that this is a again a temperature anomaly over the last 20,000 years, this period of time, the last 10,000 years is the period in which we lived in, is incredibly stable. And these are the projection into the future. Most likely, with the business as usual, we end up due along this red curve over the last uh, 200 years. So, and this is a threshold, the famous uh, Paris threshold to the two, two degrees threshold, where we can already have some impacts on, for instance, coral reef already uh, affected, Arctic summer sea ice, Alpine glaciers, Greenland, uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, Amazon, all that can be strongly affected by that. So temperature is increasing, uh, is increasing very, very quickly. So we have to invert this tendency in the coming years. And the only things we can do is uh, to reduce that since the tight link that we have in between 
the CO2 concentration, greenhouse gas concentration, and the temperature is to reduce the emission of CO2 into the into the environment. So the problem is uh, is uh, is extremely extremely important and urgent. We know that we have to reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases, and the debate on how we limit the global warming is based on the stabilization concept. Stabilization concept is something which is very clear to you, medical doctors, uh, and we have to determine what is called the um, uh, dangerous threshold and the threshold of climate. So in the end, uh, if you look at the model, uh, they tell us that the, uh, the entity of, glo of um, glo climate change and uh, of their impact depends essentially on the quantity of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The higher concentration of greenhouse gases, the higher the temperature, the temperature is. So, and the atmosphere of today is in under the actual condition is no longer in equilibrium uh, respect to the CO2 because the CO2 is continuously emitted, and the um, uh, withdrawal of CO2 from the atmosphere is not enough because natural processes, ocean and photosynthesis is not enough to reduce the concentration. So we are out of equilibrium. So we have to reduce uh, immediately the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So to stabilize the temperature, we need to reduce CO2, but in the end uh, is, uh, is, is a problem uh, of cost and uh, benefit for, for the reduction of that. So. From one side, we have the impacts of climate change. The, the higher is the stabilization temperature, the higher is the impact damage that we can do on climate and on our society because we have extreme events that cause a lot of damage. We have heat waves that cause a lot of casualties and a lot of, uh, of course, of cost. And on the other way, we do have a, a mitigation effect, so mitigation cost that is uh, most likely and most of the time is a technological effect. So as, uh, as we go down and as we increase the temperature or the stabilization temperature, mitigation cost goes down. And there is, on a cost and benefit uh, graph, there is a point in which we have a threshold which is the dangerous threshold that by definition is of about two degrees. That's the reason why uh, the IPCC and the European Commission, and in many ways, we treat the two degree, the two degree as the stabilizing temperature of our of our planet. This is a very important thing. So we have to keep in mind two concepts. One is the one is the concept of uh, mitigation, which are all the policies that are uh, taken to reduce the greenhouse gases emission and or to better uh, perform the uh, energy on our houses, uh, houses. Or the other way around is the, the adaptation. Adaptation is all the things that we take together to adapt to the changes in climate change. I give you the example in Venice, we, we built up barrier to protect the city from the high tide and flooding, which is a very, very important thing. And to give a, a to, to make an analogy with the, again with the medical domain, uh, if uh, the global warming is seen like the illness of the planet uh, uh, and of the society that live in it, the adaptation can be seen by the use of uh, pain relief and of the medicine to reduce the symptom of the of the illness, while the mitigation uh, represent the therapy that we do to reduce the causes of that. So the concept is uh, is uh, in the end is very simple adaptation. So manage what is already unavoidable, unavoidable because we know that the climate is going in that direction. And on the other way, we have to try to mitigate, so avoid what in the future can certainly be uh, uh, unmanageable if we continue like that. So we are facing a big problem for the future of our society. We lead for a long, long time during the last millions of years, the Earth oscillated from a cold period to warm period. You have sea level and temperature, so you have a cold period with lower sea level and higher temperature. But now this uh, equilibrium, this circle, 
this hysteresis is no longer available for the future. We are probably running out of what we call uh, an unstabilized Earth. So we are facing uh, this um, dramatic, uh, uh, we are really at this dramatic threshold where we can see that the Earth uh, came through time from a glacial to interglacial time, from back and back and forth, back and forth. But now that we are living in a period of time which is called the Anthropocene, a period in which the human influence of, uh, on climate is clear and evident, now we are really at the turning point, either if we can keep the temperature of our planet within a certain threshold, and again, is a famous two degree of Paris Agreement, or if we do business as usual, we cross the planetary threshold and we fall down in an old house earth that will uh, provoke dramatic damage to our society in the future. So we are really facing uh, on uh, a big, big problems. We are coming, we, and we left an era where natural changes really and uh, literally govern climate and have entered a time in which changes caused by human activities predominate. So we have to keep this in mind. Uh, I think that the uh, World Environment Day, uh, which is today, keep us aware of the uh, uh, strong influence and on the climate crisis that we human beings are uh, provoking into the environment. And with this, I wish you, the uh, uh, ERA and the EDTA community, a wonderful Congress. And I thank you again for the opportunity to speak uh, of this uh, uh, important issue for our climate. Thank you very much. And even more, that uh, the 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 banner team of the meeting, that is a healthy environment, healthy kidneys, is quite right. And really, you, we, you have delivered a very strong message to all of us. And uh, I think we, as an authority, will we made to participate to I mean to try to avoid this disaster, not in the not in the so far long term. Away. So thank you again to have been with us and thank you for the clear message that you given to us. So and now I am a pleasure to pass the microphone to our president in Berlin. Professor Capasso and Professor Barbante, very insightful lecture and hope uh, it makes a difference. So we are now coming uh, to uh, the end of our opening ceremony. Uh, I hope you will have a very interesting Congress in the upcoming two and a half days. Uh, and I hope we will see each other again in exactly one year from here in the next Congress. And this will be the 59th ERA EDTA and hopefully live uh, or hybrid uh, Congress in Paris, France. So thank you very much for listening and see you in Paris.